إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد So we got to a point where we said the, one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, one of the pioneers among the Muslims in Medina, passed away. And that's why this was As'ad ibn Zurara, radiyallahu anhu, one of the Ansar, one of Al Khazraj, As'ad ibn Zurara. And we said As'ad ibn Zurara was one of the pioneers of the Muslims in Medina because he hosted um, Mus'ab ibn Umair at the beginning when Mus'ab ibn Umair was being the teacher in Medina, Al Mu'allim. Prophet sent him to Medina in order to teach the new Muslims in Medina the f- basics and foundations of Islam. So As'ad ibn Zurara was his host and he was defending him and he was you know, spreading the da'wah of Islam. So even one of the early Muslims, Ka'b ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu, his son Abdul Rahman, he says, when my father became an old person, he's talking about Ka'b, Every time he hears the Adhan for Jum'ah, every time he hears the Adhan for Jum'ah and sal- Salatul Jum'ah, he would make dua for As'ad ibn Zurara. So I asked him, why do you make dua for As'ad ibn Zurara? And he said, he was the first one who established Jum'ah in Medina when we were in the early days of Islam in Medina, before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina. So we said the Prophet ﷺ, uh, buried him and uh, so I want to connect this story to another story. And we said that's of the person who came two times so far to the Prophet ﷺ. First time he came, he offered sadaqah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't eat from it, but he handed it over to his companions. Second time, he offered the Prophet ﷺ, and this was in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He offered the Prophet ﷺ a gift, a gift, which was food. The Prophet ﷺ ate from it, and he also gave from it to his companions. So he said, first time he said, this is one. Second time he said, this is two. And now he comes for the third time. He comes to the Prophet So he narrates this story. I'm going to r- try to read some of the Arabic there as well. Uh, and sometimes I'll just skip some of the Arabic and uh, sort of just narrate the story. So he says, I came to the Prophet Sallallahu when he was in Al-Baqi'ah. When, when he was in Al-Baqi'ah. And he had just buried one of his companions. So I'm going to link it. Maybe it was As'ad ibn Zurara's funeral, maybe someone else's, but since it all blends in nicely here, let's put it together. So he says, I come to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu was wearing two pieces, prob- probably similar to what we wear at the time of Hajj. By the way, most of what the Prophet Sallallahu most of his clothes for his daily life was made of izar and rida. The lower part, which we make izar, which we make in hajj and umrah. The lower part and the upper part. Most of the days, that's how the Prophet ﷺ would dress up. Most of the time. And that was the dress of Quraysh, most of the time. Now, in special occasions, they would wear on top of that, uh, you know, it could be a cloak. What they call abaa or jubba. Okay? A cloak and an external kind of beautiful colored cloak. They had different shapes and different colors. Uh, the Prophet's favorite dress was Al-Qamis. Al-Qamis. Al-Qamis, the closest to it is what you have as the thawb, what we call thawb today, right? Is what people wear in, in, in most of the Gulf countries Saudi, uh, Kuwait, Emirates, Qatar. It's this kind of thawb, and they wear similar to it, was, is in Egypt and, and, and in Sudan as well. Pretty much that's what you're talking about. It was a little bit shorter than what it's today, but that's it. It was below the knees, very close. But now obviously you have these modern designs. So I would, I'm assuming based on some drawings that some historians made, uh, what you have in Egypt, especially in South Egypt in Al-Sa'id and in Sudan, that's actually closer to what the Arabs used to wear. That's closer to what the Arabs used to wear at the time. So he says, I came to the Prophet, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu when he was in, in Al-Baqi'ah, in the graveyard, he had just buried one of his companions, and his companions were around him. 
So I saw him and now tried to go behind him. And he was searching for something. He was searching for something. He was looking, trying to see something on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. He says the Prophet ﷺ noticed that I was behind him, try, I was searching for something. So he saw of the upper one, which is Al-Rida. Al-Rida is on the top, and Al-Izar is the lower, bo- is the bottom part. So the Prophet ﷺ loosens or he drops the upper part so that what's between his shoulders shows. And between the Prophet's shoulders was a birthmark. There was a birthmark. It was more of a a brown patch of skin with long hairs in it. That was the seal of prophethood. That was a sign of the prophet's messengership. And it was mentioned in the previous scriptures. Khatamun Nubuwa. This guy is Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi. He has some knowledge of the scripture. And he's going to tell us the story. So he already knows about this mark. He was trying to see it. Because he already saw two signs. And he had three signs of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was searching for that three, third sign. So when the Prophet ﷺ dropped the upper part of his uh, cloak, and Salman al-Farisi, as soon as he sees that mark, he rushes to the Prophet ﷺ and starts kissing his hands and his feet. The Prophet ﷺ says to him, Tahawwal, come, come in front of me. <laughs> let's, let's figure this out. So he says, Masha'anuk, what's going on? So he tells his story to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ wants the companions to listen to this, so he lets Salman al-Farisi tell his own story. So Salman is going to tell his own story. So he says, I was a Persian man from Asbahan. Asbahan has many names in Arabic. Asbahan and Asfahan. Now it's called Isfahan. It's called Isfahan. It's in Iran today. Uh, so I was in a small village there, and my father was sort of the religious leader. Was their imam, their bishop, their priest, whatever. He was the religious leader of, of that community. And since I was his son, I was entrusted with, the, entrusted with the fire to keep it going. And it was a great blasphemy for the fire to go out in their community. Because did they worship the fire? The Persians worshipped two forces. The force of evil and the force of good. Or the force of the day and the night. The light and the darkness. This dual God. But they also the fire was connected to that somehow. I, I haven't figured that out. But anyway, it was a very important ritual or part of their religion to keep the, car, the fire going. So he says, so I was supposed to keep the fire going in the worship place or in the, in the, uh, in the temple. And my father was a rich man. So he had gardens, he had pieces of land, he had, he had a lot of property. And he was respected, well respected. So one day my father got really busy and he said, I was going to check on one of my gardens or one of my farms. So he said, and he said, I was the spoiled child of my father. So I wasn't really exposed to life. He, he always protected me from engaging with life and going through trouble. So I was pretty spoiled. Uh, and so my father would not entrust me with big duties, but this time he just said, I can't really go and check on this farm or this garden. I want you to go and check on it and do one, two, three. And don't get distracted and don't like uh, keep yourself, or don't get yourself busy in anything else. Don't get me worried about you. So his father spoiled him even in the sense he was very protective of him, extremely protective. He would easily get worried about him if he didn't turn Uh, if he didn't come back home on time, and so on and so forth. So he says, I go, and on the way, I see this church, Christian church. And I don't know what Christian church is. I see that for the first time, and I can hear something. So I go and check it out, and I find these are Christians, and they are praying. And I don't know what Christianity is, so I ask them, what is this? They said, this is our prayer. And what are you guys? They said, we are Christians. So he decided, he, he sort of found something appealing there. So he observes them and he joins them. And he loves what they have. They lo- he loves their prayer. So he spends the whole day with them until it was night time. Then when they were done, he obviously got completely distracted. He goes back home without checking on the garden or the farm. And he finds his father in a very like, uh, nervous, s- troubled state. 
His father says to him, where have you been? I've been looking for you. I got worried about you. And it shows you now the innocent side of Salman al-Farisi being a spoiled child. And he says, I was just on the, my way and I saw this church and I like what these guys did and I was observing them for the rest of the day and I joined them. And when they finished, I just came back. And really, their religion is beautiful. And his brother says, no, our religion is better than their religion. You shouldn't go there. So Salman said, no, I really find their religion more appealing than our religion. I think it's a better religion than ours. His father sees this. He says, okay, now it's getting serious. So what does he do? Being very protective, he chains his own son. He, 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 he keeps him at home and he chains him to make sure he doesn't you know, run away. So Salman al-Farisi realizes, okay, I'm stuck now with my dad. So he sends someone to that church and asks them, uh, or he actually asked them when he was with them, he asked them, where is this, this religion? Where is it based in? Like in what area? Where does it come from? They said it comes from a sham. Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. So this is, where it's, this is where the people, the main people of this religion are. So he sends when he's in, in his uh, captivity, he sends to them uh, asking, if you know about someone or any people who are coming from a sham for a visit, you guys let me know. And after some time, a group came from a sham and they were visiting, obviously Christians, they were visiting that area and they obviously did their services in that church. So they went, somebody went and informed Salman that, yeah, we have a group from Asham. He says, whenever they intend to leave and travel back to Asham, you guys notify me. So when the guys are about to leave, they notify him. He manage, manages to escape and then he joins them and he, he leaves his dad, he leaves his family, he leaves his wealth. He travels with these guys and he goes to Asham. So in Asham, they have uh, their, uh, their priest or pastor and he's their main guy, their main source of knowledge and religiosity and he runs all the services. So he joins him and he says, listen, I've seen this religion and I love it and I want to join this religion. I want to be with you and I want to learn from you. He says, okay, I'll just join you. So he wants to live in service of God in the church. So he joins him in the church and he says, I see this man, he says, I've never seen a man who's more evil than that. I've never seen a man more, man more evil than that. He commands people, he orders people to give in charity. So they spend from their gold and their silver. And he takes that to give it to the poor, but he keeps it to himself. He doesn't give the poor any, 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 anything, so he keeps it to himself. So he said he was such an evil man. But then after a while, the man got sick and then he passed away. So the congregation really wanted to honor him, so they wanted to give him a good funeral, honorable funeral. They get ready, and Salman sees this and he says, you know, why are you guys honoring this guy so much? He said, he's our like priest, our leader. He said, but this guy is no good. He said, how come? Ma How do you know about this? He said, I've been close to him and I've seen he commands you, he orders you to give money in charity. He keeps it to himself, he doesn't give it to people who need it. They said, prove it. He said, I can show you where his treasure is, where he, he's buried his, all his wealth. They said, okay, show us. They go and they dig it out and they find seven huge jars full of gold and silver. These guys really lost it when they saw that. So what they did, instead of burying him and giving him, giving him an honorable, honorable funeral, they actually crucified his body and stoned it. Then they found another priest to run the, their community. And Salman, Salman Farisi says, I've never seen a man who doesn't pray the five daily prayers who's as righteous as this man. What does that mean? He means I've seen a man who's truly righteous and devout. He's truly sincere. He's truly sincere. So he used to worship Allah SWT and do so much good and he was selfless in his service uh, to Allah and service of the community. So I stayed with him and I learned from him and benefited a lot from him. After a while, he's not feeling well, then he dies, passes away. As he was passing away, I asked him and I said, listen, I left my family, left my country, and I came here to learn from you and be learning from you, but I want to continue this process, I want to learn more. Where should I go? So he says to him, Wallahi, I don't know anyone who's upon this true religion and this true version of the religion except someone who's in Al-Mosul, in North Iraq, in Mosul. 
So if you want to pursue more knowledge and more religiosity and more spirituality, you have to travel there. So the man passes away, they bury him, and Sulaiman al Farisi sets off to Al Mosul. He goes to Al Mosul, he finds this man, he says, Listen, so and so sent me to you. I was learning with him, he passed away as he was passing away. I asked him where to go uh, to learn, and he recommended that I join you. He said, Okay, stay with me. So he stays with him and he says, I find him just as good as his friend who recommended him. And I stay with him and I learn from him and I benefit from him. Then after a while, he's about to die. So I'm asking him as he's dying, you know, I need to pursue this further. I need to learn more. Where should I go? So he says, uh, honestly, I don't know anyone who's still upon this except for one person in the city of Nasibin. Nasibin, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's to the south of Iraq. So, or to the north of the Arabian Peninsula. So, once he dies, uh, 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 as soon as he dies, Salman al-Farisi travels and he goes to Nasibin. He studies with this person and he lives with him. And then this man also is about to die. All of these people seem that they were at an old age. So he studies with him, the man is about to die now. So he says, where should I go? I need to learn, I need to pursue, I need, I need a mentor, I need a sheikh, I need a, a teacher. He says, well, I, you know, uh, I know that this whole series you've been through, I know all of these people. And there's only one person left of us who's tru uh, truly upon the true religion. And it seems these were, p these were people upon the, same, the true uh, version of Christianity that was still worshipping Allah. It seems, it seems like it. Or at least there was a lot of these elements. So he says there's only one person in Amuriya. Amuriya is in Turkey today. It's a city in Turkey. He says that's the only man left on earth upon this. So the man al-Farisi travels to Amuriya after the death of his teacher. He travels there and he finds a very good man. He says just as his other companions, excellent, righteous, selfless, knowledgeable. So he says stay with him and I learn from him. And I stay for a while. Then after that, he's about to die. So I ask him, where can I go? I want to pursue this further. He says, well, lie. Oh, my son, I know n no one on earth who's upon this. I think I was the only, I was the last man on this, on the face of earth, on the face of this earth. Salman, so he dies, passes away. Salman al-Farisi stays in Amuriya. He starts working. Well, actually, he, w he started working already before that, before the death of his teacher. And he said, I, I made some money and I bought some cows and some goats or some sheep. And then after the death of his teacher, he stays there for a while. And, uh, but before his teacher dies in Amuriya, this last teacher, he says, I don't know anyone, I'm the last one on this. But he says, this is the time. These are the signs of a time when the final messenger will be sent. And he will be sent in an area where there is a lot of date trees, palm trees. And in an area where there are two on the sides, on the both sides of the city, there are two hills that have this dark stone, you know, nature. That so he says, I kept that in mind. And he said, and this prophet, when he is sent, he would not accept charity and sadaqah but he would accept the gift and between his two shoulder blades there is the sign or the mark of prophethood so these are the signs that Salman was searching for so he stays in Amuriya for a while then one a group of Arabs came as business people they came to that area so I just want to see which tribe. Yeah, they were from the tribe of Kelb. Although Kelb is, is dog, right? But there were tribes called like this. So uh, so he asked them and he, he, he says, would you guys, if I, like, would you guys take me to the lands of the Arabs? Because the uh, description that he was given matches only the lands of the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula. So he wanted to go and investigate and he wanted to, dis uh, to find out for himself. So he, he approaches some of them and he says, if I give you, if I offer you my cows and my sheep, 
Would you guys take me to some of the main the main cities in the uh, in the Arabian Peninsula? Would you help me travel there? They said yes, absolutely. So they strike a deal. He joins them on the way, on the way, as they were getting close to uh, probably Medina area. The guys turn against him, and they actually take him as a slave. They say you're no longer a free man. Now you're captive to us. You have no power to free yourself. You're just a slave. The cows are ours. The sheep is ours. We're going to take the sheep. Okay? And you belong to us as well. And they sold him in the slave market. And it seemed they sold him in one of some of the villages or the towns that are to the north of Medina. Probably Khaybar. Maybe Khaybar. So he was, he said, I was bought by a Jewish master. When he took me to his town and I saw the part, the date trees, I was very happy. <laughs> I said, Alhamdulillah, I've arrived. This shows you as well the innocence of this man and the sincerity in his heart. His intention was sincere. He was truthful in his intention. He wanted badly to find that prophet. It wasn't about anything. He did, like his intention was not mixed with anything else. So he says, when I saw the date trees, I was extremely happy and delighted. And then I started working for my master. Then one of his cousins comes and he sees me working. And he says, I want to buy this slave from you. Would you sell him? I said, yeah, buy it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to buy him. So they strike a deal and he buys me from, my, from, from his cousin, from his, my first master. And he takes me with him to Yathrib, to Medina. And he says, when I, s when I saw Yathrib, I saw Medina, I recognized the description. It's obvious. That's the city. <laughs> That's the town. You know, full of uh, date trees, palm trees, and the two hilly areas, dark hilly areas around Medina, on the east and the west. He says, That's it. He said, I recognized it. So he said, I kept working hard, working hard as a slave to my, uh, for my Jewish uh, master. And he says, I know, I have no clue about the Prophet ﷺ that he was sent in Mecca and he was preaching Islam and calling people to Islam. And then he says, one day I was fixing some of the date trees and I was on top of it. It was very fruitful and I was, they have certain things to do with it. So I was fixing it and my master was down underneath. And I saw his cousin rushing to him and I was in a very troubled state. And he says, Qatalallahu bani qila. May Allah destroy the children of Qila. This is one of the grand, great grandmothers of, uh, of, the, um, of the people of Medina, the Arabs of Medina, the Aus and the Khazraj. They are gathered around a man that they claim to be a prophet. So Salman al Farisi, upon hearing this, he says, I lost my mind and I went down so quickly that I was about to fall on top of my master. Then I climb, unclimb the tree and I, and I ask the cousin of my master, what did you just say? He says, my master punches me right in the face. And he says, that's none of your business. Go back to your work. So I apologized and I went to my work. But I got the news. There's someone among the Arabs in Medina who they think is a prophet. So that's, he says, when it was night time, I had already set aside some, some food that I put it on the side for, for sadaqah. So I took it. And I offered it. I went to see that man and I went to offer him that sadaqah. And that's the first time he met the Prophet ﷺ and he offered him the sadaqah. The Prophet ﷺ did not eat from it. The Prophet ﷺ handed it over to his companions. So this is the story of Salman al-Farisi. Story of Salman al-Farisi. What can we learn from it? So much. So much. The most important lesson for me is the power of intention. The power, if you have the right intention, Allah will plot for you. His father plotted against him and kept him capt captive. The first priest plotted generally for his own self, for his own sake, and he could have been an off putting factor, right? To get him to say, you know, all these religious people are just, you know, the same, they're all work for their own agenda, so on and so forth. You're going to find people who are religious who really have, who's, uh, who would be really nasty. There are religious people okay, who have no manners. There are. There are religious people who have 
ill intentions, who have a lot of hatred and envy and jealousy and bad things. But there's a lot of religious people who are extremely good and truthful, right? So you can't generalize. You can't generalize. So he could have said, oh, okay, that's what a priest is. What do you think the rest of the people are? Forget about this. Forget about this. And just the, uh, you know, the other day, someone sent me a message from a new Muslim. And may Allah make it easy for new Muslims, honestly. May Allah make it easy for new Muslims. He said, like, I embraced Islam, and then he, he, he struggled in the local mosque, in local masjid, from people and how they treated him, how they're all, always having assumptions. And then he travels, so, um, and uh, as he was traveling, he, was in, he stopped over in France, and something happened, a delay in one of the flights, some issues, and he was trying to fix it, and the guy who was uh, helping him fix it, the one who works for the airlines, or the immigration was a Muslim. His name is Muhammad, French citizen. And he said he made it so difficult for me. He made my life difficult at that moment. And he wasn't helping out. It was an easy issue. He just made it so complicated. And then a French guy comes who's non-Muslim. He comes and he solves the matter in five minutes. And he makes it easy for me. And I, I, I didn't have to miss my flight. Then I ask myself, why is a Muslim behaving like this and a non-Muslim behaving like that? Then he says, I travel to a Muslim country. I'm not going to mention the country. I travel to this Muslim country. Everyone is trying to set me up. Everyone is trying to get money out of me. Everyone is just, you know, playing games, trying to get money from me, try to fool me, and so on and so forth. Wherever I go, he says, I, I don't feel even safe about people. Everyone you approach, he says, even the religious people that I met, they were trying to get money out of me. <laughs> I travel to another country, same thing happens. He says, so I ask myself, if a religion is true, is true, why, and this is the truth from Allah, why you find these non-Muslims are behaving well and doing well, and they observe your rights, and they respect them, and they try to be nice to you, they try to help you out, whereas these Muslims are just doing everything to set you up and take advantage of you. So may Allah make it easy. May Allah make it easy. And that's our responsibility that, yes, sometimes we limit religion to some of the, the rituals, which are important. But rituals are part and parcel of a bigger picture, right? Of us being you know, respectful, of us being uh, rightful towards others, being just and fair, and being kind and nice, and being gentle and merciful. Unfortunately, actions speak louder than words. They speak louder than words. So, Sulaiman al farisi did not take, he, he was so resilient, he was so sincere and powerful in his intention that this did not deter him from pursuing, you know, whatever he found to be the truth at the time. And then he keeps traveling. Imagine he could have settled in that community and say, oh, you know, I'm probably the most learned person among them. Let me make a sheikh over them. Let me be the, their priest, right? He didn't say that. He, was, he wanted to know more about Allah. He wanted to know more about life, more about the truth. So he traveled. Never mind, he didn't accumulate wealth, he didn't work. It wasn't about work for him, it was about finding what life was about. Finding who Allah was, and worshipping Him, and knowing the truth. So he kept traveling from Sham, then to Mosul, North Iraq, then to South Iraq, or North of the Arabian Peninsula, then back to, back north, in the middle of Turkey. And then also being, you know, taken as a slave, unjustly being kidnapped and taken as a slave and sold in the slave market, yet when he sees Medina, he's delighted. It doesn't seem to bother him that he's a slave, as long as he found what he was searching for. So al although he seemed to be taken advantage of, or he didn't seem to be working for himself, Allah was working for him. Allah was making things work for him. And that's the power of intention. And that's part of the hadith, or it resonates with the hadith we quoted today in the khutbah, Sadaq Allah fa sadaqahu. If you are truthful with Allah, Allah will get you what you truly want, what you truly deserve. So be truthful in Allah. But sometimes our intention is not so pure, is not so powerful. You say, I had the intention, I had the intention, but it's a lousy intention. It's a watered down intention. But when your intention is sincere and powerful, Allah doesn't let you down. And this is why the truth is, if someone is sincere and searching for the truth, Allah will guide them to the truth. If they're truly sincere. And if they don't happen to be guided, and they are truly sincere, Allah has a way out for them. But it's impossible that someone was truly sincere, 
and they want to search for the truth and they've done it because when you have an intention you're going to do what you what you need to do because intention is motivation intention is drive so if you if you are if your intention is true about something you're going to pursue it no nothing is going to stop stop you from it but if someone is say pursue and they do everything in their capacity to find the truth but for some reason they could not arrive in it allah is going to have a way out for them allah's not going to but if someone truly wants, wants the truth, Allah is going to guide them. Allah is going to guide them. So this shows us the importance of intention. That often, oftentimes we count more on tactics, strategies, and techniques, and tricks, and on our own intelligence. But we forget a greater intelligence. We forget something that's far bigger than our intelligence. When Allah plots for you, when Allah plans for you, and Allah takes care of your affairs, if the whole world is against you, you're going to get what you deserve. You're going to get the best. Look at Yusuf alayhi salam. His brothers plotted against him. And they got rid of him. They threw him in the well. They tried, thought of even killing him. Then, according to one of the versions of the story, he they sold him as a slave as well. And he was taken to the house of Al-Aziz. Then he was put in that position of temptation, being tempted by the wife of Al-Aziz. Then he was accused of trying to uh, abuse women sexually. So this is why he was taken to the prison, falsely accused. He was taken to the prison. And he spent such a long time in the prison. You know, some of the Mufassirin, they say, do you know what's the time between Yusuf salam was taken away from his father then the moment he was reunited with his, with his father and with his parents? Some of them say it was 41 years. 41 years. It's not a short time. Yusuf salam was what? Because he was with Allah, he just went through all of this. And it worked for him. This, if Yusuf salam was not taken by his brothers and sold as a slave and taken as a servant and then put in the prison, he would not be able to be in a position to interpret the dream of the king and thus to become one of the main assistants of the king and such an influential person. And it would not be, uh, the situation would not be conducive to his brothers coming and the famine happen and his brothers coming to Egypt in order to seek provisions and for, he, for him to meet them from a position of power and be able to have all of this happening. So we emphasize so much the, the concept of planning and, and being smart and finding out for ourselves, which is important. It's important. But we miss out on something that's much more powerful and that completes the picture and that's it. That's to put your trust in Allah. Truly put your trust in Allah and approach this life with sincerity. What do you want out of this life? Salman al-Farisi wanted to find guidance and follow it. So even though he was, went through all of these you know, difficult times and he was taken advantage of and he was set up like that and he was sold as a slave, yet the very thing that was meant to be against him turned out to be working for him. It, it took him exactly to where he wanted. It took him exactly to the land where the Prophet ﷺ was going to be sent. So that's how we should approach life. Yes, you can read all these self-help books, all these strategy books, and you can improve the quality of your life. Good. All of this is good and important, and you shouldn't dispense with it. That's part of this life. But don't forget that your intention, what you seek in this life, your approach to this life, your approach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your level of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so consequential. It brings about results. It's not, just, uh, it's not just theory. It's not just like this abstract thing that has no bearing on life. No. It does have an impact on how life unfolds. Truly. Your intentions have a huge impact, actually the biggest impact on how your life unfolds. But we don't, we don't do it well enough to really see the results. We don't do it well. And the Prophet ﷺ makes it clear in the hadith. If you just read it, you really say, like, where, where are our minds when we approach the issue of trust? The Prophet ﷺ says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ تَوَكَّلُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوَكُّلِهِ لَرَزَقَكُمْ كَمَا يَرْزُقُ الطَّيِّرِ the Prophet says, by the one in whose, hand, in whose hand my soul is. If you truly put your trust in Allah as you should, 
Allah would provide for you just as he provides for birds. In the morning they leave their nest with empty stomachs. They come back with full stomachs. What's the condition he mentioned? If you truly put your trust in Allah as he deserves that you trust him. That's, that's the condition. That's the point. And that's consequential. Imam Al-Qayyim, he says, أَقْوَى asbab التَّوَكُّلُ عَلَى Allah." He says the strongest factor in this life, the strongest uh, causal or the strongest force in this life that brings about effect is reliance on Allah. Putting your tawakkul on Allah. And he, then he says, he says there are people who really jump into danger and take risks in life. And they do this because they just have full trust in Allah. And he says, these people, whatever they throw themselves into, they will survive and they will thrive. Why? He says, لِأَنَّ ثِقَتَهُمْ بِاللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ تَحْمِيهِمْ He says, because their trust in Allah protects them. That's not hocus pocus stuff. That's real stuff. Imam Al-Qayyim also, he says, I lived, I stayed in Mecca for some time. And he said, I used to have some pains and aches in my, in my body. And there was no doctor. I could not afford a doctor and there was no doctor. At some time, by the way, Mecca was not, even though it was the hub of worship, it, there was not much civilization there. So he couldn't find a doctor. And he said, and the only medicine I had was Zamzam water. And I would drink it. I would drink it with the intention of having uh, or, or being healed. And he said it worked better than any other doctor or any other medicine. Then he says, and some people try it out and it doesn't work for them. So he explains that in Arabic. He says, وَلَكِنْ بِحَسَبِ الْيَقِينِ وَالْإِعْتِمَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ He says it works only based on the level of your certainty and your trust in Allah. If you drink it with certainty and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to have this effect. If not, it's not going to work. He even talks about ruqya. He says ruqya is effective when a person who's doing it really trusts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it works. It works. The level of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the ruqya works. So you have to figure out that beliefs are consequential. We, just might, we might think, oh, it's just uh, some matter inside, right? It's, it's all... You know, hard stuff that really works, right? Gravity, physical stuff, mass, weight. No, it's not. The world is much bigger than what we see physically. It's much bigger than that. There's a lot of connections. <coughs> so Salman al-Farisi, everything seemed to be against him. Everything seemed to be going downhill. But it was actually, that was exactly the best thing for him. It took him exactly to where the Prophet ﷺ was going to be. So he met with the Prophet ﷺ upon an appointment. An appointment that was made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> so the Prophet ﷺ says to uh, Salman al-Farisi, he says, Ya katib ya Salman. He says, Salman, use mukataba. Mukataba is a transaction that used to be at the time when there was slavery. It was the right of a slave to free himself or herself. So they approach their master and they say, I want to free myself and I will do the work that's necessary, that's equivalent in value, in value to me freeing myself. So, so that was known as Mukhatab. The Prophet says, approach your master and seek to free yourself. So Salman al-Farisi goes <coughs> to his master and he says, I want to free myself. Finally, he convinces him. So he convinces him and it was such a, uh, like, huge price. He comes back to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, I agreed with him that he would free me if I uh, take care, basically grow uh, 300 date trees for him and 40 ounces of gold. <laughs> huge, such a huge money. The Prophet ﷺ says, he turns to the Muslims, he says, A'inu akhakum. Help your brother. This is the Muslims help you, brother. But Muslims, most of them are poor at that stage. Yet the Prophet ﷺ shows this solidarity, this brotherhood, that this brother is a slave. We need to free him so he can really pursue his religion, pursue his worship, and connection to Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously, Salman al-Farisi becomes one of the most important companions in terms, in terms of knowledge, in terms of influence, influence to the point the Prophet ﷺ says, Salman minna al bayt Salman is from us, Ahl al-Bayt, the family, household of the Prophet ﷺ. So, uh, and Salman al-Farisi was extremely helpful, specifically what stands out, as we will, inshallah, will come to see later on, Ghazwat uh, al-Khandaq, the battle of the trench. The whole idea of digging out a trench came from Salman al-Farisi. It came from Persia. It was something that was commonly done there at times of war, uh, when an army was about to set a siege around another, another a city or a town, they would dig a trench around it to protect themselves. And they would fill it with water. So he had this idea and he shared it with the Prophet ﷺ and it came right in time, right in time to give the Muslims an advantage against all the you know Quraysh and their allies who were about 10,000 at the time who surrounded Al, -al, -al Medina. <coughs> uh, the Prophet ﷺ goes to the house of As'ad ibn Zurara, the one who he buried earlier. And he goes and As'ad ibn Zurara had two little daughters. The Prophet ﷺ, he gives them, to, uh, each one of them, uh, earrings, earrings made of gold, made of gold. They kept these earrings even to their ears, the daughters. They kept that to their children, to their children, to their children. They kept the, those ones. So the, and the, the Prophet ﷺ actually took care of the family of Asad ibn Zura. He said they are my responsibility. So he was providing for them, he was providing for them financially. And he was checking on them. The Prophet ﷺ had such a rich social life, such a rich social life. The Prophet ﷺ would check on his companions. He would go and visit people. And if someone was fe wasn't feeling well, he would go and visit him. He would check on him. Someone was missing for a couple of days. He would ask about him. He would inquire about him. People needed help. He would go and take part. He would be everywhere with everyone. So he created that bond and that connection. So <coughs> one of the companions who used to spend time with the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he used to come with his little son, toddler. His son was about two years old. He used to play with him a lot and he loved. So the Prophet ﷺ looks at him and as, he, as he's playing with his child and he says, Atuhibbuhu. He says, you love him, obviously. But it's just a way to get him to speak about his love for his child. So he says, so the, the, the father says to the Prophet ﷺ, very interesting to show you the love of a father. He says, Ya Rasulallah, ahabbakallahu kama uhibbuhu. <laughs> he says, O Messenger of Allah, may Allah love you as much as I love my son. That's how much I love my son. <laughs> so after, after a while, the Prophet ﷺ stopped seeing this, the man. So he asks, where's this guy from the Ansar? So they say, you know, you remember his son? His son died. The Prophet ﷺ goes and visits him. And he comforts him. And he says, I want to ask you a question. If you're given the choice that your son lives with you in this life, okay, and you enjoy him, that's one choice. The other choice is that on the day of judgment, any gate in paradise you want to enter it from, you're going to find your son waiting for you there. And he would not enter until he, he would wait for you and he won't enter until you come. So he takes you by the hand and takes you into paradise. The man says, I want to, on the second one. The Prophet ﷺ says, you get it. And the Prophet ﷺ says, any, uh, any Muslim that I take their child away from them and they are patient, or I take someone that they love from them and they are patient, then there is no reward for them but Jannah. There's a few hadith about this. In one hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angels. And he, he, Allah knows, but he sends the angels to check on that person who lost his child. So they would come back and say, كَيْفَ وَجَدْتُمْ عَبْدِي How did you find my servant? And they would say, وَجَدْنَاهُ صَابِرًا يَا رَبِّ يَحْمَدُكُ We found him patient and he is praising you. But before that, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angels of angel of death to take the, the, the soul of that son, he, when the, the angel comes back and he says, ما فعلتم بعبدي What did you do with my servant? They would say, we took the soul of his son. 
And Allah would say to them, أَخَذْتُمْ وَلَدَ عَبْدِي You took the son of my servant? And they would say, yes. He said, and Allah would say, أَخَذْتُمْ فَلِدَةَ كَبِدِهِ You took his heart away from him? Then Allah will send them back, check, check on him. So they will check, they will say, okay, he's praising you and he's patient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you bear witness that his reward, his recompense will be Jannah. Will be Jannah. So the Prophet ﷺ gave these glad tidings to this man. And you see the way the Prophet ﷺ consoles these, consoles his companions. And that shows that belief in Allah and belief in the last day gives us a great advantage in handling the difficulties in this life. If someone went through what Salman al-Farisi went, they would say, Oh Allah, why does this happen to me? Why this? Why that? But when you are sincere and you're focused, Salman al-Farisi was focused on what? Was focused on finding the truth. That didn't really matter for him, the other stuff. And that's it. When you have a goal that is connected to Allah and you're so, you have this laser-like focus on it and you're so sincere about it, I'm telling you, the, your experience, your predicament in life, your hardships in life will be watered. They will be filtered out. You won't feel it. You won't feel that much. Why? Because your heart has not lost what it thrives on. That's the point. So the Prophet ﷺ used to give this kind of uh, this kind of consolation and this kind of respect and this kind of connection. So he used to socialize a lot with uh, with his companions. Now Aisha radiallahu anha, being in the house of the Prophet ﷺ, she asks him permission to go and check on her father. Her father, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, used to live in the same house with Bilal and Amr ibn Fuhayra. Amr ibn Fuhayra was who the shepherd of Abu Bakr who helped them out for the hijrah, for the immigration. They were living in the same house. And uh, so she goes to the house and she says that's قبل أن يفرض الحجاب علينا Before the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were commanded to take a shield or a screen away from people, not to expose themselves not to meet in person with other people right they used to they were supposed to be in their house later on so so she goes to the house and so some level of mixing was allowed at that time still at that time so she sees her father she sees Bilal and she sees Amr ibn Fuhaira and they're all hallucinating they're speaking some nonsense and even Bilal <laughs> was speaking some real nonsense so she looks at her father and he's saying some lines of poetry and she says, Wallahi ma yadri ma yaqul. Wallahi doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> she checks with Amr ibn Fahira and he's hallucinating. She says he doesn't even know what's coming out of his mouth. She goes and checks on Bilal, he's the same thing. She says, he doesn't even know what's going on. And he's like mentioning uh, all the names of the people of Quraysh who used to torture him. And he's, a, he's not, he's in a, in a trance. So what was exactly happening to them? That's next week, inshallah. So next week, inshallah, the halaqa will be on. And I won't, I don't want to keep you more away from the potluck. Jazakumullah khair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I can take two or three questions. I can take or two or three. Huh? We got ten minutes? Okay, so then we take more questions. Questions? MashaAllah, no questions today. Yes. Salaam for the I don't know if they are the Aryans or whatever. I really don't know. So that what the narration mentions, and the narration is in Sirat ibn Ishaq, has been authenticated by the scholars of Hadith, alhamdulillah. So it just mentions they were Christians. It doesn't mention anything. But we can infer from the story, seemingly, these were people upon monotheism. It seems like it. It seems like it, most likely, yes. But who exactly, which denomination? <laughs> I, don't, I personally have no knowledge about this. But probably if someone investigates that, they might find some traces, probably. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, 
لا سلمان الفارسي this is a privilege is like universe Harvard University gives this uh, PhD what do they call it honorary PhD yeah honorary PhD so he was given that status just to himself not out of lineage is just a status that was given to him by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because of his sacrifice because of his position as well so it's not uh, by blood it's not by any other thing and and I, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think it extends to his uh, progeny as well. Probably just to him, yeah. Because Ahl bayt have to be from the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, any more questions? Good question. Uh, Salman al Farisi left his father in order to pursue the truth. <coughs> Same Ahl Kahf. Ahl Kahf left their people. Uh, so the question is in these days, if someone embraces Islam, someone starts practicing, you know, should they, at one point, at what point should they sort of move away or move out? I would say, generally speaking, don't disconnect from family. Don't disconnect from family. Now, you have to use your judgment. If you're being in the same house with your family is really very detrimental and extremely like uh, uh, consequential when it comes to your practice of Islam, your Iman, your level of Iman, then definitely you have to do something about it. Because some people have this strong presence, strong personality, and really they're, they're on, they don't bother. Like someone gives them a hard time, they're going to give harder time to that person. Don't mess with them. Some people have this strong, this resilience about them this tenacity about them and really a negative environment doesn't affect them that much but some people are sensitive so you have everyone have to have their own assessment if it's detrimental to your faith if it's negatively affecting the level of your iman and you feel it's getting really bad probably the person might need might need to take uh, some sort of a drastic or radical approach uh, maybe i'll just need to move out but i would say as much as you can keep a connection even if you move move out keep a connection why because still, even if your parents are non-Muslim or non-practicing, if you are good to them, you're getting so much reward. Being good to the parents is not contingent on religion. It's a principle. And uh, keeping connection with them might one day open their hearts to hear the truth. And you don't want to lose that opportunity. Um, so it's, it's, the pers it's, the it's the person's judgment. Person's judgment. Uh, obviously, with Salman al-Farisi, it seems he was his father was very domineering and overbearing, so he was uh, had so much power, and it seems that he was a very sensitive, soft person. Salman, Salman moved out. That's the only way for him to figure it out. And then being in the Arabian Peninsula after that, we don't know how long he had been in the Arabian Peninsula before seeing the Prophet Salman embracing Islam. So we don't know exactly whether he had chances or wha his father was still alive, we don't know about that. But what we know is that he stayed in Medina and then it, it doesn't seem that he went back home afterwards. Yeah. Salam. On? You mean the Christians that he met? Yeah. Okay, the... <laughs> yeah. Well, Christianity, by, by the definition of its own uh, scholars and theologians, went through a lot of phases. So uh, there's a long history of Christianity going from one phase to the other, uh, undergoing uh, huge challenges. 
uh, and in the uh, in the first few hundred years, although there was the change, there was a huge change. This became dominant. What ended up being uh, Catholicism mainly, uh, but still a lot of there were a lot of patches here and there of people who were still upon the true version of Christianity or a great part of it, a great part of it. Don't forget, at that time, communication was not through the internet or phone or phones, so. It was easy for people to live in, in enclaves, in towns, and not being out of touch of the world. Uh, so it's easier with the media now and means of communication to dominate. But in those days, it's easy to find people who have different versions of Christianity. So what it seems is that up in, uh, uh, the people that, because even in the words of these teachers, the teachers of Salman al-Farisi, they said, I don't know many people who are upon this. I only ha know a handful of people. So that shows, although there was lots of Christianity, Christian people at the time, especially in Asham, that was where the Roman em or the Byzantine Empire was. So there was a lot of Christians. So uh, why did these teachers say it's only one or two people left upon this? So it shows this was not the dominant, which was mainly Catholicism then and, uh, and Orthodox Christianity. So it seems like it was more of a Unitarian, probably uh, monotheistic still version. Seems like it. But uh, as I said, the, the, the narration doesn't specify anything. So I'm going to stick by the narration. But OK. OK, any more questions? Can you speak up? I'm really not sure when that fact that Ahl al-Bayt are not allowed, it's haram for them to take sadaqah. It's haram for them to take sadaqah. I'm not sure where that started, if it started before Islam, but whether it started, whether there was something before Islam or not, in Islam it was started by the Prophet Sallallahu that he said sadaqah is impermissible for Ahl al-Bayt. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu when he saw Al-Hasan, the son of Ali, and he approached, there was uh, some dates for sadaqah. He's a little boy, he's uh, probably two, three years, two, I guess two or maybe younger. So he sees, w he takes one, one date and he puts it in his mouth. The Prophet says to him, kuch, kuch. And he gets it out of his mouth. And he says, in the sadaqah la tahillu lana. This sadaqah is not halal for us, it's sadaqah. So he takes it out of his mouth. Uh, interestingly, the Arabs say, say kuch, kuch until now, like something like spit it out it's, it's not it's not pleasant all right don't touch it it's filthy all right um so i don't I really don't know if there was something before but yeah. is there a, logic behind a logic behind it there's no logic stated but we I mean people could improvise scholars could improvise what uh, just as well preserving the Preserving the, the status of the Prophet ﷺ and his family. Because sadaqah entails having the low, being on, on the low, lower end, receiving end. Uh, so it's not pleasant for the status of prophethood as well. Yeah. But uh, there must be uh, other wisdoms, but this could be a basic one. Any more questions? It could be, it could be. Uh, I mean, it could be this way. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. If someone's lineage goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes, sadaqah is not halal for them. Yeah, sadaqah is not halal for them.
anyone is truly, truly from Ahlul Bayt and they know it for sure, Sadaqah is not halal for them. They cannot take Sadaqah. Even if whatever, even whatever, it's, it's not halal for them. Even if they fall in one of the categories for zakah. Because, uh, so who do you give your sadaqah to anyway? You're going to give it to a poor person. Is that 10 minutes? Or not yet? One more question. That's a treat for you today. The manners uh, that this, w the story we mentioned about the convert who seen this uh, um, bad behavior, I would say, from Muslims. And for its culture. It's culture. And obviously, when someone cheats, that's a sign of a weak iman. When someone steals, that's a sign of a weak iman. When someone lies, that's a sign of a s weak iman. So obviously, it's all connected. But unfortunately, a lot of cultures in Muslim countries, they sort of allow this. They sort of give space for that, unfortunately. But uh, that means not fe don't feel desperate. We shouldn't feel desperate. It means everyone should take responsibility and ownership over their own conduct, their own character. If I grew up in a culture that sort of uh, somehow gives advantage to you being... Uh, um, I don't know, being selfish or taking advantage of people or being treacherous, then I, I, take, it, I take control of myself. I'm going to see that as a blind spot because most of the time, whatever we have in our cultures becomes a blind spot. We don't see it. So I'm going to figure it out for myself. If that's wrong, it's my responsibility to fix it. I'm not going to blame my parents. I'm not going to blame my culture. That happened. Now, from now on, I'm going to work on myself to fix this. Someone finds in themselves, it's easy for them just to come up with a lie and to tell lies. If that's the case and I find myself lying, it's my responsibility to make it a goal that I will start working on this issue until I resolve it. That's the only lesson that we can do, the only take uh, away from such things. It's not just to put Muslims down on, uh, or just to put Muslim countries down. On, no, I mean, there are, we have a lot of serious issues. Otherwise, our ummah would not be in that state. But what really concerns us as individuals at this time is Ya Yuladina Amanu at this stage, Alaikum and Fusakum Laya Burukum and Dalla Ida Hadaitum. All you who believe, worry first and foremost about yourselves. Fix yourself. Do not be, you know, distracted by those who refuse guidance. Focus on fixing yourself. I mean you can still talk about people, the people do this, people do that, that's bad, that's not good, that's against Islam. Fine, but what do you do by complaining? You're not achieving anything by complaining. But if you figure out something is wrong, you see it in yourself, you start working, taking practical steps to fix it and improve yourself, then you're doing well. That's the most important thing to take away from this. Okay, so we're done, inshallah. Jazakum khair. See you next week. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Enjoy the potluck.